convenient. So does everybody, is there a problem if you take your exam and you essentially record uh, on your computer a video of yourself taking exam pretty much like what I'm doing right now? You would just take record myself and I can also record the screen on my computer so I can make sure so there's dual you can record what the camera is doing and you can record the screen uh, and that's essentially what my computer is doing right now so zoom can do it for sure um, right now you're seeing my face that's recorded by the integrated camera in this case you would basically point it to whatever you would like and at the same time, uh, record your screen so I can see that you're not online searching or um, anything like that. Is that a problem for everybody? So I would like to think you think that through and also test it, try to test it, like try to basically do a five second, 10 second, 20 second test where you're recording those things. So the way the, 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 I envision the exam to start is that you would basically start the exam and you would show your face and you explain who you are, what you have with you. So you show you like I have some paper, I have notes from the class, the, I have a textbook and you show the textbook um, and so forth. Uh, so tell me if you have any issues. If the only version of the textbook that you do have right now with you is PDF version, then in that case, um, Basically, you would use it as a PDF uh, on your computer, and every time that screenshot of the of your screen would essentially show you using the uh, textbook. Uh, so there should be no issues with that. Okay. So let me know if you would have issues recording yourself uh, doing an exam like that. Okay. Okay. My computer is not cooperating this morning. So we have started energy or heat transport and the fundamental problem, or the simplest problem in heat transfer, is when I just have a piece of material that is not moving, and I have one, I have a temperature gradient exposed, and I'm exposing this material to a temperature gradient. And in simple, simple one-dimensional case, I have a difference in uh, temperature between two planes, uh, so in this case, I have a slab of material and I have bottom plane and top plane. So I can orient this problem, whoops. I can orient this problem as a one dimensional problem, but essentially I know that there will be some heat transfer to equalize these temperatures, typically from the high temperature to the low temperature. The simplest way we can model this is Fourier's law, which looks very much like Newton's law, which says, okay, flux is proportional to the gradient of temperature. And in this case, I'm just talking about one dimension. So in this particular example that we had uh, last time, I have that QY is minus K dT dY, and K is thermal conductivity or this coefficient of proportionality, which is a material property. Oh, we wow. also went. Mm -hmm. Are you oh. sharing the screen? I sh I shared the screen. I I didn't. Okay, I clicked on it. it. Apparently, didn't share. Okay, let's do this again. Thank you. So uh, basically, if I have a slab of material, um, then I have temperature gradient uh, across that material from plane to plane. So I'm keeping planar, these surfaces exposed to two different temperatures. And I'm assuming that there is a way to keep them at constant temperature. In that simple case, basically then um, my transfer, heat transfer in this 
what I'm denoting as a y direction will be proportional to the gradient in the uh, gradient of temperature. That physically means that it's proportional to the difference in the temperature T1 minus T0 and inversely proportional to the uh, length y that I need to essentially travel in y direction. So that gives me a simple one dimensional Fourier's law. And I can also um, do the same thing in all other directions. So technically, and as a generalization, I have that Q1. Qx is minus kdt uh, dx, qy is minus kdt dy, and qz is minus kdt dz. This assumes that my thermal conductivity in this homogeneous material is uh, constant everywhere and doesn't change based on the direction. This could in some cases actually change if my material is not what we call isotropic. It's not the same in all of the directions, but possibly has some complexities within the material that change uh, my thermal conductivity in different directions. So in this, actually, we can recognize this are uh, QX, QY, QZ are simply X, Y, and Z component of a vector Q, which is my flux, heat flux. And I can recognize gradient of temperature, dt dx, dt dy, dt dz. Um, this is essentially partial derivative in this particular case. Uh, so uh, my D should be that delta. So basically I have a gradient T here. Um, now my thermal conductivity, actually I can look at it from this law and I can figure out that the units are uh, joule per second, which is watt per meter per Kelvin. I can also normalize thermal conductivity and talk about thermal diffusivity. So if I normalize K, uh, by dividing it with uh, rho, which is density of the material, and its thermal capacity, okay? And that gives me a units of thermal dif uh, diffusivity that are similar to kinematic viscosity. So I can actually compare for the material whether its um, momentum transfer would happen faster or more efficiently than, um, than uh, thermal or heat transfer. Okay. Now, we also know, so I'm going to just actually flash this entire uh, combined energy flux. So if I actually have things flowing, so I don't have a static material, but there is actually fluid flowing, then I have a much more complex situation. So then in, in addition to Q, which is my um, uh, heat transfer simply and only because of the differences in temperature, between two spots. I also have things that are happening there because the fluid is flowing. For one, fluid is flowing, so at every point I will have, I will see a different fluid packet, if you will, move into my frame. And that packet is carrying energy with it. And basically, if I sum up my kinetic energy and internal energy and the velocity of fluid, I have a momentary flux into my spot that I'm looking at the, in my coordinate system that is equal to some of those energies times V. Okay. Now, second part is actually that I have uh, fluid layers and those fluid layers within uh, uh, my uh, control volume are moving at different velocities. And so there's some friction within uh, those layers and that actually does work. And work is energy, so I have to take it into account. And basically, since my molecular work is ha, has a very complex expression using both my uh, shear stress tensor and my pressure, hydrostatic pressure, uh, if you remember, we were uh, we had that molecular stress tensor that has both of those within uh, denoted as p. Then then. This is essentially matrix uh, times vector. So uh, I can evaluate the energy that I, or the work done by the molecular forces within the fluid uh, by multiplying the stress tensor and velocity. And that's what's in here. So you can just mentally remember that as F dot V. So my force dot uh, velocity is the rate of work done. Okay. So this gives me combined energy flux, and this is what we will need to balance now in every uh, volume element, okay? So I will skip 
momentarily what we went uh, over. So just want to point out the different um, materials. So when I look at gases, liquids, and uh, solids, their thermal conductivities will essentially be on different orders of magnitude. And that will be important for my boundary conditions when I solve the problem. But also you, those are tabulated and those are known because they can be measured. So thermal conductivity is something that I typically know, especially for hom homogeneous materials are measured. I do have, of course, in porous media, a little bit more trouble finding what effective thermal conductivity of a medium is, specifically when I have a complex three-dimensional structure, a uh, porous material that might be filled in with different fluids, then I have to, I can still compare to my Fourier's law and figure out what is the effective um, uh, thermal conductivity of, the, of a medium. And uh, that's something that is done similarly to effective viscosity or effective any property. Uh, I could look at the effective property of the medium. So for some simple cases, and I had this case of simple spherical inclusions within a material. So if spherical inclusions have conductivity K1 and material is K0, and I have phi as a fraction of these spher spherical inclusions, and it's considered small, then I actually can find out a formula. This is Maxwell's formula for effective conductivity of this material expressed with K0, K1, and this fraction phi. Okay, so that's just uh, thermal conductivity. Okay, so now we will actually move on to shell balances and uh, see how are we going to balance things to actually solve problems. And we're going to today solve one simple problem where I don't have uh, fluid movement. So what happens? I will again look at my control uh, volume, a little control volume, and it's going to be between x and x plus delta x, y and delta uh, y plus delta y, and z and z plus delta z. This is my Cartesian coordinate system. Okay. Now, let what we will look at in my energy flux uh, basically quantifies what could come in through the boundaries of this fluid and what would also come out. So when I have that energy flux uh, vector E, basically I will, it's expressed as flux, so it's per time and per area. So basically I will integrate it over this area or if this uh, area is constant and E is constant on this plane, then I'm just really evaluate that flux at this side and multiply by the area to see what's coming in on this side. And same on the other side to see what's coming out. I'm going to evaluate it on this side and multiply by area. And that's what's coming out. So basically rate of energy coming in minus what's coming out. This is in X direction. I actually have to do the procedure for all of the directions. So basically same for uh, y uh this is my x y is from the back and my z is from the top in this particular and then going to the bottom uh so basically this is what i'm gonna do uh for the a general um shell and this is what we call shell in the coordinate system okay so this is this part and that's going to be quantified with that energy flux e i also have to add rate of work done by any external forces that are acting on this medium and any sources and sinks of heat that I have in this volume. So I could literally have well, a fire going on and that's a heat source, right? And that's what's happening inside of this medium. And I typically know what is the rate of this um, by either uh, by, by volume happening in my uh, in my volume. So that will give me energy accumulation inside of this medium. Uh, if I don't have accumulation, I have a steady state system, then this accumulation is zero. So our steady state problems are relatively simple. Basically rate of energy in going in minus what's going out plus any rate of uh, work done by forces within the medium plus any sources or minus any sinks is equal to zero. Okay. And this is just to, uh, to, to do the same uh, thing. We're going to actually work on this. Uh, this is really just for your uh, 
for your general um, reference this slide, but we're going to start working on the problems. So let's actually just go through our shell energy balance procedure in general. Uh, and this procedure is very similar to what we were doing, uh, doing before. And then we're going to actually start working on a problem. So all of this will fall into place. As usual, we always have to domain what, uh, define our domain, what are the boundaries, what is the coordinate system that makes sense for the problem. Choose it so that there is uh, that the velocity or main velocity terms or flux terms are aligned with the coordinate systems is important. Uh, so basically, I'm going to align my coordinate system with the uh, flux and flow as much as possible. And uh, basically state any assumptions on what are those terms, what velocities exist, what flux exists, um, uh, and what other coordinate terms it depends on and list any sources, sinks, uh, or anything that ha is happening within the volume. Okay? And this is also at the same time, it's important to list what the boundary conditions might be. Uh, now, basically, uh, so for each volume, it's important to then write the equation of continuity and motion, if flow actually exists, as well as the energy balance okay? over this entire uh, volume. And then, uh, use uh, use that balance to actually arrive at an equation uh, uh, that basically uh, solves uh, for the problems within and uh, use the boundary conditions and any initial conditions to actually close the equation and solve it for the particular problem. Okay, so now we will actually move on. Uh, you will see a strange flip because I'm going to flip over and start writing. And the problem that I'm going to be working on is the problem from the textbook. I'm going to actually, so we are actually now going to start working through chapter 10. And uh, I will, before I go into that, I will actually start uh, discussing boundary conditions first. But we will work uh, uh, a conduction through composite walls. So this is going to be chapter 10.6 in BSL. So let me actually introduce the problem, uh, introduce boundary conditions first. So possible boundary conditions. So when we solved momentum transfer problem, we typically had a continuity of velocity, okay, over a, uh, uh, at a point that it could be a boundary point. So we often had something like no slip defining saying, okay, velocity is going to be zero at the solid wall, basically assuming that solid wall is not moving. Otherwise that velocity is going to be the same as the wall, wall velocity. Now here, uh, we don't have velocity anymore. We are actually looking at temperature. So we can have our boundary conditions expressed in terms of temperature and fluxes. So my typical boundary condition could be that my temperature so temperature is given at some surface. And often the surfaces will be aligned with coordinate planes. Now another uh, boundary conditions that boundary condition that I could have is that my flux Q is, and I'm going to put that as Q in normal to a surface is given. Okay, so this is also value. So this is normal flux through a surface. And what I mean normal is basically what is coming through the surface normal to uh, aligned with it normal. Otherwise, if it's tangential to the surface, it's not going to come through. This video is really funny when I'm, um, when I'm like here picking from a corner. Um, anyway, sorry. Um, and then if I have a boundary of different materials, I will typically have a continuity of flux. So if I have boundary uh, of similar materials, so let's say boundary surface. between similar materials. Uh, 
I will actually have that my temperature, similar materials means thermal conductivity on the same order of magnitude. So for instance, I had my uh, cup of, here's my cup, okay? And I put hot coffee in there. So if I'm looking at the, how is this coffee cooling or tea rather, this morning I made tea. Then if I'm looking at the surface between my hand and the metal, I think I can technically take that as two solids uh, with similar thermal, thermal conductivities, though they're mostly made of water. So I'm not sure that that's actually correct. But basically I can assume that between two solids, I'm going to have, I'm going to call that similar materials. However, transfer between solid and air, those are materials with vastly different um, thermal conductivities, typically two orders of magnitude. So those I cannot assume similar. So I can actually have a jump in temperature between this wall and the, uh, and the gas or air next to it, simply because it takes a moment for that transfer to happen because gas has very, very lower thermal conductivity. So in that sense, uh, if I have similar materials, so for instance, two so solids or two fluids, I can assume that T is continuous, temperature is continuous at the boundary. And so is flux. So my Q, uh, oh, this copy race, QN is continuous. So there's continuity of flux and there's continuity, and there's continuity of temperature. Now, if I don't have a similar boundary, uh, a similar material, so I'm going to say boundary uh, surface. No similar materials. then depending on these uh, materials and uh, basically depending on the thermal properties of those two materials i'm going to have h which is heat transfer coefficient basically how effectively can i transfer heat between the two which is similar to the thermal conductivity is just it's now a boundary of two materials and not just one material. And then my QN, so let's say that I have um, solid. Oh, I wanted to change color. So let's say that I have my um, boundary and there is solid here and fluid here on the other end. So there is certain effectiveness of transfer described by H. Okay. And then I have something called Newton's law of cooling saying that QN is H times TS minus TF. Newton's law of cooling. Okay. So that's going to, that can be the boundary conditions could have a form uh, like this, okay? So again, non-similar means that I have different orders of magnitude in thermal properties. Okay, so let's now actually uh, solve a problem. So my problem will be example. And my first example is gonna be oddly 10.6 uh, in degree. And it's a conduction through composite walls. Okay. So let's say that I have a composite material. And technically, I have three pieces. Okay. 
So this is x, x, 0, x, 1, x, 2, x, 3. So this is my x direction. And I'm insulated all around. And I have some, so this is insulated, there's insulation all around, so there's no transfer really in y and z direction. My heat is coming in this way. And here I have ambient temperature Ta. And Tb. And those are actually in fluid. Oh, whatever happened here? Fluid, fluid. So, and this are solid materials. So now I'm wondering uh, if I actually have, if I'm keeping this Ta at the larger, much larger temperature than Tb, I'm going to have a flux of heat across these three different materials. And the materials, let me change this a little. Okay. Um, seriously. Materials have three different. Uh, coefficients, so my K01, K12, K23 is thermal conductivities in each solid material. And I also have so I have, this is the example where I have Newton cooling law. So basically I have heat transfer coefficients. So H0 is heat transfer. H3 is heat transfer coefficients. Between fluid and this material one and solid one and solid one, the uh, solid three and fluid on the other end. Okay. So those are actually, so that's happening to zero and each three. And if this is my X, so let's say this is X, Y, Z. I'm going to assume insulate, insulated in Y, Z directions. So there's no heat. Insulated essentially means there is no heat transfer happening in those directions. So how are we going to go about solving uh, this problem? And we assume, of course, that we know this Ta and Tb. We don't know what is the temperature distribution uh, within this material. So let's uh, basically look at what do we have here. First things first, uh, let's look at our, and I'm gonna change color for that. If I remember my energy flux, okay? It's described by internal energy or a total energy within the volume, and I'm gonna write it down. I can just actually, since I don't have it, so I'm just gonna say energy total times V plus we have that work of molecular forces dot V plus Q. So this was basically convection 
this was basically work of molecular forces. And this is just the heat transfer due to temperature difference, temperature gradient. Great news about this problem is that there is no fluid flowing. So V is zero, no fluid flow. And because of that, Okay, basically I can just say this is zero and this is zero. So all I'm looking at is heat transfer due to temperature gradient. That's the great news. That's that's the problem that is simpler to solve. So my energy flux is simply Q. Okay. Now my Q is QX, QY, QZ normally. So I have three components, it's a vector. But since I have insulation in y and z directions, basically these two are zero because of insulation. Okay. So all that is left is qx. And the way I drew this coordinate system, essentially we have uh, qx is a function of which which uh, coordinate is q x function of anyone anyone listening hello excuse me um can you repeat why the g uh the, the so my qy had... and qz are zero right yeah and qx is the only one alive flux in x direction so isn't it just I, x just x yes so q x of x so this is a 1d problem okay now i have some certain width of the material let's say that there is a height h and width here in my y and z directions and i'm going to use that simply to evaluate area but that area will essentially disappear from my equations right because the the flux in itself is normalized per per area okay so now when i'm actually balancing things uh, and i'm going to draw here so i have the same uh, th everything on the same slide so if i think of a small oops just a moment, I'm gonna erase this in a second, since there's no way I can write, do a straight line. So if I think of a small volume, and this small volume could be inside any of these uh, regions, solid regions, I have three of them. So I'm just gonna generally think about it as from X to X plus Delta X. So I'm going to have stuff coming in through this boundary, right? And stuff coming out through this boundary. And that's evaluated by flux. It's per, it's rate per area. So per time per, I'm thinking about it, quantity per time per area to count what all is coming in in the X direction. It's really my QX evaluated at X times area what is area of this general side here it would be in this case delta y delta z right in this small case of y so this is just in inside any of these delta y in minus q x at x plus delta x delta y delta z and then i would technically have to look at q y and q z what's coming out through those boundaries but q y and q z are zero so it doesn't matter right so i'm going to say plus zero in y direction 
otherwise there would be an equivalent term like this and plus zero in z direction and that has to be so i'm looking at a steady state problem i don't have any sources of heat inside of this and i'm not looking at any external um, uh, work of external forces so basically that has to be equal to zero okay now there's no this is a one-dimensional balance I, I i was working within this very small uh small area but i could have done this balance over this entire slab and instead of delta y delta z just write wh that is perfectly fine and this is how textbook does it okay. so my equation is actually simple qx evaluated at x minus times this area minus qx evaluated at x plus delta x times the same area is equal to zero. Oh my goodness that is simple and what that comes down to i'm now going to move on to the next page and i'm not going to keep this green color but what that comes that i'm going to just read by the qx times area um, uh, minus qx times area so that's that really is immaterial to solve the problem is equal to zero. And I will actually divide this by this area. And I'm also going to divide it by delta x. So technically I'm going to divide it by the volume of this little control volume and i'm gonna get that minus q x x plus delta x divided by delta x is equal to zero is everybody comfortable with the way i did this so technically this just disappears when I divide by delta x, I kind of bit just extracted this minus, and then qx is evaluated at two boundaries, x plus delta x minus qx at x. Yes? Everybody good? Do I need to repeat anything? Gonna take that as a no. All right. Can you go back to the small portion that you took on the last page? This one? Yeah, based on the coordinate system, uh -huh. from y to y plus delta y, or z from. So basically, where where this green business is, let me actually use the same green color. I'm just assuming it's some little thing right here. Okay. But it could be here as well. Anywhere, anywhere inside. And what you could also do, what I'm saying, you could basically. Also, I'm going to use slightly different, let me use, well, orange. You could also do the balance over this entire slab. In which case, your area would not be W, uh, delta Y, delta Z, it would be WH. Yes? Yes. So that's simply because it's technically one dimensional problem. Okay. And the way I like doing it is kind of more general. So in any other problem, you would still have this same little box as long as it's Cartesian coordinate system. Thank you. Either way, again, that area is the same. Uh, you just divide by it. So it disappears from the equation altogether. So it doesn't really matter. That's why it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, so again, there is basically there is insulation here. And because of that insulation, nothing happens in Y and Z. And if nothing happens in Y and Z, it's really a, your pick how, how you're more comfortable. What do you see better right, between this yellow and green version? Yes? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Either way, we chose, we would basically divide by that area and by delta X. And we would get the same equation. So now I can take limit as this delta x goes to zero 
And uh, what I get here on the left hand side is the definition of a derivative. Okay. Now, in this case, I have qx that depends only in x. So it's really d qx dx is equal to zero. Otherwise, I would have a partial derivative, right? I mean, negative, but whether I put this, this is my ultimate partial differential, partial derivative. In this case, it's an ordinary differential equation. It looks super simple, right? So what this really means is that qx is some constant. Now, here is what I know, and this is where I'm actually starting to incorporate boundary conditions. I have to have between all of the solid materials, I have to have continuity. So technically that constant is same in every solid material, right? Same in each of the regions, solid materials slash regions. I will have Newton's law of co cooling to tell me uh, it's still the same quantity, but that quantity has to jump the boundary. So that boundary between fluid and solid on one side, on the other side is defined by Newton uh, uh, law of cooling. And oh, But I don't really typically solve, or I certainly don't measure Q easily. What we measure typically is temperature. So even though this is actually a very simple solution to this ODE, I still haven't gotten to the temperature because that's what we typically measure. So what this tells me is normally I have Q is minus Q gradient T in general. And since my Q, Q, Y, and Q, Z are zero, I'm really looking at the X component of this. So DT, DX. In this case, the problem is that each of the three solid materials has a different K. So this general equation is valid in every region, but with a different K. So this general equation is valid in every region but i have different k in each region so technically if you will i think i called those k's were zero one one two two three I don't know why I didn't book, call them K1, 2, and 3, but I'm going to leave that to them. And so basically what I have is that minus K, uh, I'm going to call it I minus I, I. And then I'm going to have a temperature in each region T, I, D, X is equal to some constant. And that constant is same for all three zero, uh, materials. So I'm going to call it Q0. Constant, the same for all. And this is my for I is equal to one, two, three. So I'm just trying to shorten my writing. And just if you confused by that I'm going to write it down so basically what this means is that minus q01 dt1 dx is q0 in region 1 and then minus q12 dt2 dx is equal to q0 and minus q23 dt3 dx is equal to q0, where my q0, 1, q1, 2, and q2, 3 are thermal conductivities of these three materials.
And then what are the, so those are my three equations. Okay? And I'm just going to state the boundary conditions. Uh, and then we will apparently have to continue this next time. So basically what I have is I'm going to have Newton's law of cooling here on this boundary. Okay? I'm going to have a Newton's law of cooling here. And I'm going to have a continuity of my temperature. I, I already imposed continuity of fluxes by calling that flux Q0 everywhere. So basically, I'm going to have continuity of fluxes here. Okay? So basically, basically, I'm going to have, so for my boundary conditions, okay. I'm going to have Newton's law of cooling. Like that, and then I'm going to continue at x is equal to x0 and x is equal to x3 and continuity of p and q. So x, well, x0, uh, x0 is the x1 and x2, okay? So once we actually, and just to look at the nature of this, so this is a constant here, and this is a constant in all of these. So basically what I have here is that the t dx is a constant, which gives me a linear form. So temperature is linear. It's just that this is a slightly different linear function in each of the material, and it's slightly different because of this k. Okay, and then we just have to put them together. So the rest of the this is actually simple. It's a simple solution. It's going to look complicated because I have multiple regions, and we have to work out uh, all of the numbers. But other than that, it's actually the simplest case of them all. Temperature is piecewise linear in each of the materials and depending on the boundary conditions we will see what those values are right so we're going to continue that next time okay dr perdonovich i had a question uh -huh. um so the goal of this was to find the temperature at each point right yes because that's typically what we measure we we balance flux right but i'm measuring temperature Okay, got you. Yeah, so that's because that's flux, flux is the quantity that is actually balanced. The amount of stuff that trans, goes through a boundary uh, in time, right? That's what I can balance. And in this shell balance, I'm basically collecting all of the contributions of everything that kind of goes through the boundary. So I have to just, I have this flux, which is per area, multiply it by area, and then just collect all of the contributions on all sides. In this case, it's just one side, so that was simple, right? Everything is just coming through x and leaving at x plus delta x. Any other questions? Okie dokie. So basically, uh, we're going to continue this and then we're going to do uh, uh, one more. Well, we're going to do probably three more examples. Uh, we're going to do three examples altogether uh, in this um, part. And your next homework uh, will actually will be assigned today um, because the conceptually, basically, um, we have most of the stuff in here uh, for this first homework. Um, so we are actually ready to assign some problems already. Alrighty. Keep, and I'm going to post the slides. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for the office hours? If so, I'm going to stay online. <laughs>